welcome to worship on this 29th of August. How did it get almost to be September? I don't know. Time is flying really fast. And I will tell you that starting next week, next Friday, I'm going to be on vacation. And I'll be back on the following Friday. But Sunday, you will hear a sermon by Matt Gaventa, and he will be preaching. He's a gift of Covenant Network, but he serves as a pastor at the University Presbyterian Church in Austin, Texas. So I'm really thrilled to welcome him to the service, that virtual welcome. And I'm also going to say we are going to have some visitor this visitors this morning from Chinatown Presbyterian Church. Welcome. Some of the folks in that congregation are worshiping in Golden Gate Park, and some are just joining us for this virtual service. And I'm thinking about us getting together on August, no, oops, on September 12th, we're going to be moving um, to in sanctuary service in-person worship. Um, this is the first time we will have worship together in, in over 18 months. And um, we're hoping we can worship um, continually in person. But you know, with this Delta variant, we have to be kind of careful. But as of today, we are worshiping together on Sunday, um, um, September 12th. It starts at 11 a.m. And I want to tell you that we will we will continue to have um, online services. It will happen through live stream. And we had a practice session a couple of weeks ago. It went pretty well. I'm gonna tell you, we're, we're still learning this and experimenting with it and evaluating if we're gonna do it every week. But right now, we're going to be doing it and I appreciate your patience. And you will be able to get a bulletin downloaded. You can get it beforehand to follow along. Um, by going to our website, www.oldfirst.org. And I'm going to tell you, in these worship services starting Jan starting September, boy, I'm all over the map today, starting September 12th, um, we invite all that have been fully vaccinated to join us for in-person worship in the church because protecting each other's health is really important to us and it fulfills the mission of this church to love one another. We will wear masks during the service. We're going to use hand sanitizer and observe social dis dis distancing. There's not gonna be a coffee hour, but you'll be able to walk outside after church and greet each other in the fresh air at the corner of Ines and Sacramento. And we invite all those who haven't been vac fully vaccinated or are unwell or unable to come to worship to join us for online services. And again, there'll be a link um, at our webpage to the bulletin, and you can link um, to that service on our webpage or just go to the Old First um, YouTube channel. And we're going to continue to send out links for each service, at least for a bit on Sunday morning. And I'm just thinking how much has been going um, on in our world. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Um, I pray care um, for the people and all those that are working with the increased hospital hospitalizations with this Delta variant. And um, just keep in your prayers those who are dealing with the effects of an earthquake in Haiti. And um, just thinking about and praying for the people whose lives had been just in upheaval with the flooding in Tennessee. And I know many of us are carrying heartbreak about the situation in Afghanistan and are just in shock with the recent deaths at the airport. And I invite you to go and see um, information about Afghanistan um, evacuations and refugees um, on our website and on our Facebook page. It's done by the Presbyterian Mission um, group, and you'll learn some ways that we can still care and be compassionate to folks. And I just want to say I'm so thankful that I've had this series called I've Been Meaning to Ask, a series in 
curiosity and contact and connections and compassion. And we're now gonna watch a video on that. Where do we go from here? I'm glad you asked. We go from this place with new languages of love for ourselves, for our community, and for our world. One thing I enjoy about pastoral ministry is officiating weddings. While I cherish the moment of the wedding day, I enjoy offering encouragement to couples along their journey of doing life together with their spouse. I can remember one young bride called me about six months into her new life of matrimony. Aisha, I think this marriage is over. I asked her to elaborate. She began to talk about how she and her husband could not see eye to eye. Aisha, we don't agree on anything. I'm not sure that we're going to make it. I asked her, have you read The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman? We talked about how each person must learn the love language of the other so that their loved ones might receive love in a way that makes sense to them, even if it means learning something new for ourselves. I am convinced that in this new season of our lives as a church, that we need some new languages of love. We need new love languages so that people can receive God's message of love in ways that make sense to them. The way I see it, we need to learn the languages of digital space and deep justice. In other words, you may have to learn the nuance of expressing God's love via Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or Zoom or some text messaging app and maybe even get a TikTok account all in the name of loving your neighbor. I can remember the first time I had to sign on to create an AOL instant messenger account in the late 90s. I was serving as a middle school youth director in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the time. My username was Dreadilocks because clearly I had more hair than I do now. I did not participate in that method or mode of communication because I loved it. I did it because I loved the kids. Our love language of digital space and technology tells the world that God's message of love, it translates in person, behind a screen, and everywhere in between. In the same manner, love languages of justice, it's not new, but it needs to be reimagined for each season and each generation. People need to know that God loves the condition of each human body as well as the state of each soul. We know that the scriptures call on justice to flow down like rivers and that all who follow God are to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God. What does deep justice look like in a diverse, multicultural, and intercultural world? Your definition of justice may not be the same as your neighbor. You can only speak a love language of deep justice if you engage with your neighbors in a way that is authentic and empathetic. Mm -hmm. Love languages of deep justice may require time, investment, sacrifice, and a decentering of your priorities and your way of being in the world. New love languages of deep justice will demand that you learn to listen, and I mean really listen, to the cries of others. It will demand that you take the time to see the hurt, to feel the intensity of the pain, to listen to the outcries, to see the inequity, the systemic trauma, the pleas, the unsettledness, 
and the yearning for deep healing in our broken world. We have got to go from this place with more love, bold love, radical love, tangible love, deep love. We must go from this place with languages of love that articulate the hope, innovation, truth, justice, and mercy, even if it means we have to change again and again. Let us join together in a call to worship. If you come into this place with a hope of growing deeper, with the hope of connecting, with the hope of glimpsing God, if all of these things take place and your spirit is moved and you swear that God is near and you feel more than lucky for the gift of faith and then the service comes to an end and it's time for you to leave and you ask yourself, where do we go from here? Then I would say to you, go out into the world and to love and share and to learn, but come back soon because this is the beginning. This is only the beginning. So come on in, fill your cup here, be present here. God is here. Let us worship holy God.
Hugs. Hugs.
me offer a prayer of illumination before the scripture. Holy God, we know that you are always speaking through strangers and friends, through sunrise and sunset, through random acts of kindness and feelings that stir hope in us. We know that you are speaking through dreams and prayers, through a still small voice and burst of overwhelming joy. Be with us today, Lord. We know that you are always speaking, and we also know that we are inclined to miss it. Settle our spirits now to hear your word fully. We want to be part of the conversation. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. I will be reading from Ruth, chapter 1 through 22. And I would invite you maybe during the week to read all through the book of Ruth. It's not very long. It's a, it's a fascinating story. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, and they were Ephraimites from Bethlehem in Judea. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took Moabite wives, the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And when they lived there about 10 years, both Ma Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and had given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal, deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. And then she kissed him and they wept out loud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, no, turn back my daughters. While, why, why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husband? Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept out loud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth just clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or go back from following you. Where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. 
So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has de dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity on me? So Naomi returned together with Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've really enjoyed this series that we've done in the last three weeks. I've been meaning to ask a series on courage, curiosity, and connection, even though sometimes I put an extra C word in there like compassion. And I, I'm caught by the theme this week. I've been meaning to ask, where do we go from here? But because it seems so key to where we find ourselves right now. We're kind of in this um, change space. We're gonna start doing online, start doing um, in-service worship. We're trying to figure out what it will be like to be the church once again after pandemic. It, we're looking for normal and we know it's gonna be a new normal, not the old normal. And. I'm just caught that it's not going to be the same old, same old. So I like, where do we go from here? And I also will say that I was um, thrilled that we're reading um, Ruth this week in the theme. I, I'm really caught by the book of Ruth. And I remember a few years ago when I preached it, preached on Ruth. I said I was going to preach a series on the whole book of Ruth. And some of you got really nervous because you're only supposed to do a couple verses, not the whole book. People thought, that's a bit much, Maggie, and they were overwhelmed. And then I smiled and said, well, really, the book of Ruth is only four chapters and 85 verses, and 55 of those are conversations. I think we were ready to handle that. And in the Jewish calendar, it is read at Pentecost, around, um, around the time of harvest. And in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, it falls in a section called the, called the writings. And it's, some call it, and it's right between Job and Lamentation. That's where that section falls. And between, between, um, these two books, it kind of carries, it carries accounts of suffering in which the people cry out to God. And really, Ruth also begins in sadness. It starts out with three widows who have all lost their husbands, and, um, and in some ways, they've lost everything. In the Christian location of the Bible, um, Ruth is pretty important to us. And it's important because it falls for us between judges and kings. And it's in the midst of a scripture that is filled with threats of war and trickery and treachery among brothers and sisters and violence against women. And in the midst of all that, Ruth tends to be a story of tranquility in which people generally act well towards each other. It's like a fresh of breath air in the scriptures. And it's a place, stories where outsiders are included in the community. We find that in Ruth and God's loving kindness is lived out. We find, we find um, ourselves also in anxious times. There's a COVID 
um, Delta variant and the tensions. There's a lot of tensions in families lately and schools are starting and that's a anxious time for parents and teachers and workers and kids. There's the recall of the governor coming up and the Tennessee floods and the earthquakes and all that is happening in Afghanistan. In some ways, this passage, this story is right for our times. And it's a compelling story. Probably the work of a single storyteller, one who is really um, gifted at crafting a tale. It kind of reads like a novella. Lots of speculation of who wrote it, but we don't know. It's kind of narrow in its focus. It's about one family and especially two women in that family. But it also has a broadness in it because it speaks of a God who works in human relationships as people treat each other with loving faithfulness, with care, with loyalty. And it starts out that there is a famine in Judah. And it's so bad that Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons leave their own land. They leave Bethlehem, Bethlehem, which ironically means the house of bread. And they go to this foreign land of Moab. I mean, Moab is really held in negative regard by those in Judah. I mean, people from Moab were seen as less than. But when you're hungry, you migrate to where the food is. And the family, the mother and the father and these two sons, went with the hope they would find enough to eat, enough to survive, and maybe they'd even find a welcome. Maybe they went with a dream that they would find easy times again. They'd have a full house with grandchildren and enough food for everyone in easy times. And maybe they'd even have enough to put away for when times got lean again. But Elimelech dies and Naomi becomes a widow. I mean, it's not totally destitute for her being this far away from home because she has two sons who can take care of her. And these sons, they marry local women, Moabites. And again, if you married a Moabite woman, you really wouldn't write home and tell the family about it. And while they were there in those first 10 years of marriage, there must have been enough food for everyone, but life wasn't really happy or complete because none of those Moabite women had children. And remember in that time to have no children made a woman less than. And so sadness and maybe even some shame were a part of their lives. And 10 years they lived together and then the sons died and then there are three widows. And you know in that day that a status changed for a woman the night after, the overnight when their husbands died. They had no rights, no means of survival. They were treated with disgrace and sometimes blamed for the state they found themselves in. Three deaths and three widows, Ruth, Orpah, and Naomi. So no wonder Naomi plans to send her daughter-in-laws back to their family, to their people, so they can have food, so they can be cared for, so maybe they can get remarried and she sends them back for their own good. Naomi sends them back home with these with these words, a prayer and a blessing. Her love language is care for their protection, for their welfare, for the security over her own needs. I mean, they love each other. It's a family unit, but she is committed to them so much that is she is willing to let them go because she can't guarantee them enough when she gets back home. Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you might find security in each of you in the house of your husband. And then she kisses them and they weep aloud. It is a loving prayer. May the Lord deal kindly with you. That, that word is hesed. Loving kindness goes with you. 
It tells me that the daughters-in-law lived with Naomi in a relationship of loving kindness. And they didn't want to let her go. I mean, they went beyond what was required. And because they found more than just toleration, they found home with Naomi. And she wants loving kindness to go with them and that they will find security. And so they kiss and accept a hug and they, then they weep. And it's surprise when she, they say to her, no, we will go with you. We're, we'll go to your people. Your home is our home. We are family with you. Orpah and Ruth are willing to go to this unfamiliar land of Bethlehem where they are not held in any kind of high regard. They just can't bear to leave her, Naomi. And they, they don't want to let her journey alone. It's, it, it's as if they can't bear one more death. And this time of loss in their mother-in-law I mean, honestly, she had become their mother. And in the midst of their own loss, their husbands had died and their own grief. They just can't let her go alone. They are committed to her. And then Naomi speaks again to them. I mean, her, and her pain and her bitterness creeps out. She speaks um, to a custom in that day with people, if the son dies, the widow may marry another son of the family. And Ruth says, I can't help you. I'm old. She's probably in her fifties, but that's old enough. I can't give you, I can't give birth to sons. And really, would you wait till they were of age so you could marry? No, go while you can. It isn't just the loss of a husband and sons. She said, God has turned against me. She felt cursed. Make your home with someone else. And there's more weeping. And the, both daughters-in-law, they make individual choices. Orpa kisses her mother-in-law and goes home. And do you notice here, she obeys Naomi and goes back to her people. But Ruth, she clings um, to Naomi. She won't let her go. It's more than a mere embrace. She clung to Ruth. And it's interesting that that word clung is only found in one other time in the Bible, and it's in Genesis. A man will leave his mother and cling to his wife. Ruth is clinging to Naomi like it is her own life, her future. Naomi tries to persuade Ruth one more time, go back to your family. And Ruth replies with these often quoted words. Do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, even even if death parts me from you. I mean, we often hear these verses, or I do, at weddings. Because this vow, um, it becomes like a vow, a covenant, a relationship. But that's really not what's going on here. One person said in that really this is the most radical statement of commitment in the Bible. It goes beyond social expectation. Naomi urges Ruth to see security in the husband, in a new husband that she will find, and Ruth chooses to commit herself to Naomi. It is this act of radical solidarity to a woman in near desperate circumstances. Ruth says, your home, your people, your God will become mine. Where you go, I'll go. And if you die, I'm going to be buried right next to you. It's a, Ruth loves Naomi. It's her love language of commitment and care and empathy for her. See, Ruth 
um, statement also kind of um, echoes the unending and far-reaching love of God. I mean, Ruth's response is, it's, it's not, I'm not going to leave because things are getting tough. I mean, it's rooted and grounded in being bound to the other. In the face of such loss, her family ties she developed with Ruth um, were really important. And they're, they're deepened by kind of a spiritual connection and commitment. Ruth is willing to live and to worship and to work and advocate and walk alongside and find her earthly resting place with Ruth from that day forward. I mean, that is compassion and, and empathy to the top. And I think of our own time right now. I mean, we have experienced a lot of grief and death and lots in the midst of this racial um, kind of unrest right now and global pandemic. I mean, there's been so much going on. And so I think we can feel some of the anxiety of that day and understand that total thing that Ruth is saying, I'm going with you no matter what. And what I find kind of surprising in the story is that Naomi hears that Ruth is determined and she says no more. She, she is silent. And some would say she's overwhelmed by Ruth's love and cannot speak of it. Or maybe she's irritated and frustrated that Ruth is not following her advice. We, we really don't know. But we do know that life is not as either of them expected. And the two widows journey silently home to Bethlehem that has now become Ruth's home too. And the story also makes me realize that, well, it really starts out with pain and grief and disorientation, and yet they're st still open to a journey. I mean, Ruth's story helps us consider and remember that in times of our own crisis, um, or places where we're seemingly at a dead end or a time of uncertainty, which that's going on, it slowly gives way to movement. Even if the movement is a journey towards an uncertain future, there is still moving forward in community, in relationship. I mean, the future may be uncertain, but God is in the midst of this and that situation, and God is still at our end. Hmm. Reverend Brooks Johnson, whose short video you heard earlier in the service, reminds me that, again, that we have experienced a lot of death and grief and loss in the midst of this pandemic and racial brokenness and economic disparity and political division. She says, can you imagine a world in which we took the spiritual oath like the one we find in the book of Ruth? What if we resisted the temptation to fight or flee in the face of grief and pain and, and oppression? What if we took these vows, not really, to, we took these vows with members of our human family? Imagine a member of the human family before you you go and speak those words out loud again. Not just a spouse, but think, I'm going to care for the others in the world with this deep commitment. Your pain will be my pain. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to listen with you. I am not going to leave you. By the mercy of God and because of God's grace, we are bound to one another. Your pain is not your pain alone. Now it's my pain. The plight of your people is held in my hands and in my heart as if they were my own. Where, where you journey and work, I too will journey and work alongside you with God's help. Isn't that 
an interesting way to look at this passage if we carry that kind of commitment for the other into our daily lives. If we carry that kind of understanding in our words, that would be a love language. Where do we go from here? One pastor um, thinks about this and wonders, instead of being distressed and anxious for ourselves, can we imagine the language that we might spend, might speak to send the message, we're here for you? What would be the language we would use to step out of our normal places, we're at home, and learn the custom and cultures of others and the ways of others? I wonder if we can learn to listen deeply with faithfulness and courage for Jesus' sake. It is the, and what does it mean to love and listen in that way? Well, I think it's a love that listens deeply, that cares not just for someone's soul, but also for their body. Um, It's a deep justice-seeking love. A love that's not just in there for the short haul or when it's easy. It's a long-term love. I'm there until you die, as Ruth would say. It's a love that um, is authentic and um, has empathy and it's deep listening. It carries with it a willingness to really listen to the other's pain and experience. It's a, it's a conversation. It's a holy conversation. And I I think at Old First, we're really trying to have that kind of holy conversation and share the love, the language of God's love and wholeness as we seek to understand um, racial and structural um, injustice and structural racism. And we're trying to look at our own racism and the privilege that many of us have Um, white people like me who have gained by that system. And we're trying to break it down. First, we're going to listen deeply and learn as we seek to break down that racism. But it's not going to happen quickly. We have to learn um, other people's stories and, and see what it means to be a partner. It's about listening deeply to each other and probably confronting hard truths about ourselves. I think that's what we're committed to as we ask where are we going to go from here. And it's no simple thing. It means we have to look at our culture and also learn another's culture. Ruth did that. But I think we're ready for such a challenge and we're working on others with this. Where do we go from here? How do we show God's love language to our community and to the world? Well, I know that we're going to go on this journey together. We're going to seek relationships with people in our own church, but we're going to seek to care for the world further from our own walls. And We're going to do it together. We're going to seek to be God's holy people committed to each other, learning the language of love and working to kind of speak that language of love so others can understand and experience it. May God make us fluent in loving each other. Amen. Let us join together in the affirmation of faith. We believe that God is a conversationalist, drawing close to us and asking, what do you need? Where does it hurt? Who do you long to be? We see this conversational God in Jesus Christ, God's own flesh, who walked the earth speaking with the poor, the hungry, the lonely, the outcast, Therefore, we believe that our call as people of faith is to continue this holy conversation with those that look and think like us, as well as with those who share little in common with us. We believe that through conversations,
we are able to catch a glimpse of the kingdom of God as we continue the conversation in hope. Amen. Creator and sustainer, we give you thanks. We thank you for a church that strives to be just and authentic as your grace. We are especially thankful on this day for the Covenant Network and for the many saints that have worked tirelessly for equity and inclusion and to be able to freely and openly serve in your ministry. We pray for those in countries that face uncertainties of political unrest, including Tunisia, Afghanistan, and Haiti. And in these days of summer, we are reminded of the fragility of your creation as wildfires burn and wildlife suffer under the unrelenting heat. We pray for the land and for the creatures. We give thanks for those who fight on the front lines protecting lives under these harsh conditions. We also pray for people seeking employment, people who have recently been in hospital and now are recovering at home, those undergoing cancer treatments. We continue to learn and despair as we learn new terms for the COVID-19 pandemic. Breakthrough, Delta variant, Gamma variant, viral load, N95, KN95. We pray for those who have had positive COVID tests recently, even though vaccinated. We pray for those who would like to have access to the medical care, but lack resources. Those who work on the reception desks and security in hospitals, who deal with anxious and worried people with respect and patience. All those who have friends and family in hospital and do not have limited access to visit and those who are in hospital seeking for, um, to get health. Give us strength to continue to be responsible and vigilant during this prolonged pandemic. We give you thanks for those who serve at Old First Presbyterian Church. Pastor Maggie, Larry, Brad, Irwin. We give thanks to the section leaders who lead us in worship each week. And we give thanks for those church members who have been working to figure out how we will return to in-person worship and those who have been bringing us together virtually in these worship services weekly. And we pray this week for our prayer partners and for the ongoing healing for Sebastian who had his appendix out this week. Amen. Friends, I'm hoping we learn the language of love. And we can learn this language of love. We can do and be people of love because God has loved us first. So we're going to go from this place rooted in God's love, moved by God's love, and end into the loving hands of God. But in the meantime, May you know that you are loved. May you walk in the ways of Jesus, the one who listened deeply, who sought justice for all God's people. And may the Holy Spirit move you forward on the journey in ways we never imagined. Thanks be to God. Amen.